Good afternoon, and welcome to our webinar on Talking SMS, Safety Communication. I'm Stuart Mater, and I lead the Public Transportation Agency Safety Plans, or PTAS, Technical Assistance Center, within FTA's Office of Transit Safety and Oversight. We're also joined by Andy Lofton, a contractor supporting FTA's PTAS Technical Assistance Center, and our industry speaker, uh, Teresa Ampostato from the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. Throughout today's webinar, we invite you to type your questions into the Q&A box, and FTA will review these questions and will provide answers during our Q&A session in the latter half of today's webinar. These slides and a recording of this webinar will also be available on the PTAS TAC uh, resource library within a couple of days. Our goal for today's webinar is to review existing PTAS requirements for safety communication and identify some ways your agency could choose to meet the requirements for safety communication for PTAS. And I'll now turn it over to Andy to go over our agenda. Thanks so much, Stuart. Welcome everyone. During today's webinar, we're gonna start by providing all participants with an overview of the existing PTASP requirements related to safety communication. Next, as Stuart mentioned, we're gonna hear from our industry speaker, and then we're going to hold a question and answer session. We also do wanna take a moment to let everyone know that during today's webinar, we are going to discuss current PTASP regulation requirements. And what that means is that we're not going to discuss questions or content related to the recent notice of proposed rulemaking for 49 CFR Part 673 that FTA published on April 26. Again, so today we're going to focus on existing PTASP requirements. And as Stuart mentioned, later in today's presentation, we're going to have the opportunity to speak with Teresa Impostato. Um, she is the Chief Safety and Readiness Officer at the Wa Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, or WMATA. And we're really excited to have Teresa with us today. And before we get rolling, we do want to point out where all of today's participants and, and anyone back at your agency can find more information, more resources related to PTASP. We'd like to encourage everyone, if you get the chance, to log on to FTA's PTASP TAC resource library. And in the resource library, you can find all kinds of resources, um, sample documents, tools, fact sheets. You can also find recordings of past webinars. And it'll also be the place where, you, where you'll find a, a copy of the recording of today's webinar once that's posted in a few business days. And with that, I'm gonna hand the microphone back over to Stuart to talk about our, our feedback process. Stuart? Thanks, Andy. And we wanna uh, thank everybody who's continued to fill out our surveys uh, that we suggest for each uh, webinar. Uh, your feedback continues to help us develop and deliver these resources, both the resources that we have in the library, as well as our, our lives technical assistance like these webinars. And we wanna make sure that they're most relevant to your needs. So your feedback continues to help us with that, in particular with evolving the webinar format. Um, so you're going to hear from industry speakers. Uh, we're going to conduct some more live polls today. Uh, we've also shortened the webinar length a bit. Uh, we're finding that the hour webinar uh, seems to work better in terms of schedules, and uh, we're having expanded time for Q&A as well. And we're going to uh, kick things off uh, with our next poll. And in the spirit of this continued improvement, continuous improvement and evolution of formats, one of the questions we wanna ask about before we get started is the platform through which we provide these webinars. So our first poll is gonna ask you a question about uh, your preference around the platform that we're using. And so that question is in an effort to, uh, to uh, continue to evolve our formats. The question is, do you prefer to keep webinars on this platform, the Zoom platform, or would you have a preference for us to move webinars to the Microsoft Teams platform? So that question is open for your votes now. All right, thanks everyone for your feedback and 
as I think we can see on the screen, really no preference. Half, half of the people that do have an opinion would Zoom, the other half on Teams, but 45%, um, it doesn't matter. So thank you guys for that feedback, and that helps us ensure that whatever method uh, the PTAS TAC uses moving forward will be the right one for the community. We appreciate the feedback. And next, Stuart is going to walk us through the PTAS requirements for safety communication. Stuart. Thanks again, Andy. And I want to, as Andy said, touch briefly on the requirements for safety communication to set context for today's webinar. As you know, uh, Part 673.29b uh, of the PTAS regulation requires transit agencies to communicate safety and safety performance information throughout the agency. And as you think about the four components of SMS, the importance of communication is in letting your employees know uh, and your uh, community uh, throughout your organization know the impacts of the work that's being done under SMS to identify, assess, and mitigate risks, and also to make sure that employees uh, see how the, the agency is taking action in response to reports submitted through the Employee Safety Reporting Program, or ESRP. So at a minimum, the, the requirement requires uh, agencies to convey information on hazards, uh, safety risks relevant to employee roles and responsibilities, and inform employees of safety actions the agency takes in response to reports submitted through the ESRP. And with that, we're gonna bring up one more audience poll. So the question here is thinking about your current role in your organization, how do you engage with your agency safety communication process? And your role may include more than one of these as well. And Andy, as our audience responds to the poll, I hand it back over to you to discuss the poll results and then talk about some further considerations for safety communication. Thanks so much, Stuart. And thanks again, uh, participants, for your participation in our poll. We really do appreciate the engagement and your feedback. And we'll keep that open for one more moment, and then we'll look at our results. All right. And it looks like when it comes to the communication process, really we're touching on a lot of the aspects that we, we drew up in this poll, but 76% of our participants today receive information on hazards and safety risk relevant to their role and responsibilities. That's a good sign. Um, over half of our participants communicate information on hazards and safety risk. And then we have almost half help draft those communications for the agency. And then about a third receive information on actions taken in response to ESRP or actually communicating those actions taken in response to employee safety reporting reports. And we have 29% drafting communications on safety action. Um, so we do have a, 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 looks like the majority of our participants today are actively engaged in the safety communication processes at their, at their agency. So. That's a good sign for the group we have for today's content. And as Stuart said, what, what I wanna speak about next, um, we, we just covered the relatively simple or, or brief requirements for safety communication in the PTAS regulation. But before we um, move to our industry presenter, we wanna talk about some of the considerations that an agency may think about when they're developing or updating their safety communication processes. And the truth is it can be easy to overlook safety communication as what really is one of the more essential elements of your agency's overall safety management system. And if you think about it, we all communicate with our colleagues basically all day, every day. And but we probably don't spend a lot of time thinking about how we communicate and when we communicate and how that is really essential to our safety mission. Um, safety communication sets the tone for our agencies and effective safety communication really can contribute and help to build a robust safety culture at our agency. 
Safety communication fosters improved safety performance. We can think about ways in which that can be accomplished is communicating lessons learned, communicating information related to hazards or safety risk throughout our agency, as well as broader safety information. And as we touched on a couple of slides ago, by communicating those actions that the agency has taken in response to informations or information or reports submitted by employees to resolve safety concerns. Now, given that safety communication can play such an important role in establishing and maintaining uh, our agency's safety culture, here are some things that you can think about, some concrete things, when you're reviewing or perhaps updating your agency safety communication process. So number one, flow of communication. One of the quickest ways to improve uh, an agency's safety culture is to sure that, ensure that communication flows freely through the organization. So that means flowing from frontline workers all the way up to the top and from management all the way down across and through the organization, through all levels. Um, another thing we can think about is our actual communication processes or mechanisms. So asking ourselves questions like what are the mechanisms or what are the specific tools that we use to communicate safety information? And are those tools the right ones for our agency today? Given our agency's current operational situation, our size, our complexity, and our communication needs today. And finally, another consideration related to safety communication would be the feedback loop and the overall importance um, to a safety management system that safety communication plays. So thinking about that, how do we know that information that the agency has communicated to uh, the workforce has actually landed with them and has resonated with them and, they're, and it's understood? How do we know that they've heard that communication and that they understand what is expected of them based on that information? And on the flip side, how do, how do workers, especially frontline workers, know that the agency has heard them? And how do they understand that the information they've provided has resulted in real action and potentially uh, safety performance improvement? And so really connecting that feedback loop so that this communication can flow all through and around continuously the, the agency. So in considering current communication processes, perhaps part of an annual ASP update process, you may want to consider these types of questions. And with that, I'm excited because we get to the, to the best part of today's webinar, which is our industry speaker. And we are really fortunate to hear from, today from Teresa Impostato. With more than 20 years in transportation, Teresa joined the Washington Metro in 2019. And Teresa currently serves as the Chief Safety and Readiness Officer for Metro. She's responsible for the oversight of the Safety and Readiness Organization, which is comprised of the safety, environmental, quality, system-wide accessibility, occupational health and wellness, and technical training and development teams. And with that, Teresa, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to you. Thank you very much, Andy. And thank you everybody uh, for giving me some time in your day. It's my sincere hope that you benefit from hearing about some of the experiences we've had at WMATA. And I really look forward to everyone's questions. So with that, the structure of, of my presentation is essentially to cover the, the requirements as, as we see them in the regulation kind of in two parts. If we could advance to the next slide, please. Uh, safety promotion, as you all well know, covers competency and training as well as communications. Uh, the Washington Metro has undertaken a suite of activities to enhance our competencies and training, as well as improving and expanding our processes for safety communication. Uh, if we could advance, please. 
first and foremost, with regard to competencies and training, when we started the process of drafting our agency safety plan and standing up our safety management system, we recognized that we needed to look within the safety department before we looked outward and throughout the entirety of Metro. So we set about learning um, what our current level of maturity was with regard to safety staff, subject matter expertise, and prior experience. We conducted a gap analysis around areas where we had strengths and identified some opportunities for improvement. We developed a multi-year staffing plan to ensure that we had the right balance of talent and experience amongst the safety team that would scale appropriately to meet the needs of Metro. Uh, so we balance that through external recruiting, as well as setting up developmental and growth opportunities for our internal existing safety staff. Um, we developed training workshops and rolled out a process for lunch and learns for our safety department staff allowing our, our folks to really hone in on specific domains within the safety discipline. Uh, we have the best good fortune to have a, a number of experts in specific applications of safety skill sets. And we have been fortunate to create an environment where our staff are able to learn from other staff members as well as to call upon the larger, broader expertise that we have available, both internal and external um, at Washington Metro to help enhance skills, as well as develop a forum for questions and answers and ultimate learning. We've also uh, started developing some overview videos of our SMS, again, to reinforce and explain to folks the various elements of the safety management system, concentrating on each specific area, and working to show practical examples of successful implementation of the safety management system. Um, as we've rolled out our safety risk management processes, we've developed SMS training that we're delivering to our frontline workforce who are actively engaged and involved in implementing the safety risk management process. We've also uh, partook of internal and external uh, formal training courses to enhance and improve our skill sets. Uh, we concentrated very acutely on the skill sets of our safety event investigators. Uh, we were very fortunate to be able to recruit some individuals who had significant investigatory experience and were able to invest in our staff to really upskill their ability to not only identify root causes and contributing factors, but to work to improve the corrective actions to really target those root causes um, and correct them at the source. We're also uh, having developed a new employee orientation update. Um, we believe very strongly that one of the best ways for Metro to really set off on the right foot from a cultural perspective is with our new employees. So we've developed a module for our new employee orientation, orientation training that explains the SMS, that explains how Metro manages uh, safety, for employees, as well as our customers and the environment within which we operate. Our new employee orientation process actually includes meeting members of the safety department. Uh, we have staff from the safety team that will attend and present at new employee orientation. And we really emphasize employee outreach. Um, if you have a concern or if you have an issue, we stress the lines of communication that are available to employees beginning um, at the start of their employment with Metro. We're also working on developing some broader as well as more in-depth SMS training. Uh, we've revised our operations rulebook to make it more succinct as well as more clear and to allow for us to begin to embed certain values throughout our workforce. One of the key 
areas of our culture that we're really working on is creating an environment where folks feel comfortable expressing concerns and issues, creating an environment of psychological safety. And when we took a look at a lot of our rules and procedures, we found that they were appropriately very rigid in process, which is required, of course, to ensure safety. But a lot of the language that was used in, in prior rules really read like a list of very sharp demands of what folks should not do instead of encouraging folks to do things a certain way that would ensure their safety. So we took a step back and really worked on addressing the overall tone of our rules and procedures to emphasize to folks the actions that they should take while de-emphasizing all of the thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not that was written in our rule book. Um, we're anticipating going live with our new revision to the rule book uh, later this year. That's not to say that we don't have um, certain prohibited practices, but we found that when we took a look at it, everything being structured as a thou shalt not really de-emphasize the criticality of the things that folks shouldn't do. So when you see something in the Metro rule book that says do not, um, it's much more clear and striking to the reader. Uh, lastly, what we're working on from a competencies and training perspective is embedding safety values and behaviors into our performance management process and our job descriptions. One significant cultural change that the implementation of a safety management system has brought about at Metro is a more mature understanding that the value of safety at Metro is boundaryless and that the responsibilities and expectations for employees to contribute to a safe working environment and an overall safe operation do not begin and end with the safety department. We felt that it was really important for us to embed our core values and the expected behaviors into our performance management and job descriptions so that it was clear all employees are accountable for fostering the environment that creates the culture that will improve safety at Metro. And all managers are accountable for establishing clear expectations for behaviors of, the, of our employees and really holding, holding folks accountable as well as coaching and developing the appropriate behaviors. This is something that um, we've seen really great collaboration and partnership with our human capital team. And we think we'll start making a difference in terms of ensuring that the approach that the agency is taking with regard to safety risk management is boundaryless and um, really communicates to everyone the importance of safety, not as a priority at Metro, as a core value. We've started changing our vernacular um, in all of our materials to note that safety is a core value. It is sacrosanct and cannot be compromised. And regardless of constraints on resources, safety will not descend a prioritization chain. It is always a bedrock expectation uh, that we provide a safe work environment for our employees and a safe operating environment for our customers and the region. Next slide. So with regard to communications, I, I've said a lot about what we value and what we do. One of the things that we've realized in implementing our SMS is we needed to come up with new and innovative ways to reach our workforce. One arguable benefit of the pandemic was that it really forced a lot of agencies, Metro included, to reconsider how we communicate with our staff. And one, one thing that Metro realized throughout the evolution of the pandemic was that we had some pretty significant dif disconnects with our workforce that didn't report to facilities, that didn't have desks. Our frontline workforce weren't getting information in the manner in which it was easily accessible and understandable to them. And we really didn't have mature processes for ongoing feedback loops 
with our frontline workers. So as we started developing new and innovative ways to address and connect with our workforce during the pandemic, we uh, decided to start tapping into those efforts in our communications around the implementation of our SMS. So we uh, started and expanded during the pandemic some podcasts, um, really dealing with concerns and issues that employees had relative to guidance that was provided by the CDC or actions that Metro management were taking to assure con continuity of service within the region. We leverage those tools to start creating podcasts around safety success stories. And the podcasts that we've created for safety success stories weren't really limited to just safety department employees talking about repairing an item that had been brought to our attention. We chose to feature individuals who had raised concerns through our approved channels and really wanted to talk about their experience in identifying and tracking through to resolution a safety concern or issue. So we have a series of vignettes that we've put available throughout our intranet, as well as available throughout facilities that highlight the success stories that we've had about identifying safety concerns and issues and working to get them managed. We've also really increased our safety reporting campaigns. Uh, Metro had some pre-existing lines of communication for folks to report safety concerns and issues. We found that many of those channels of communication were largely one-way channels where employees would report a concern um, you know, via suggestion box type interactions. And the safety department would coordinate with individuals, disposition the concerns, and that's pretty much where it ended. We realized that we had a great opportunity to revamp and revitalize our safety reporting processes to close that loop and provide feedback and updates on the dispositioning of safety reports that our employees have made. We expanded our, our safety reporting hotline so that employees now reach a live person um, on the other end of, of the call from the safety department who will work with them to identify all of the specifics associated with their safety concern. And we track through to resolution transparently the concerns that we receive. So employees can go back and track the dispositioning of their concern. And we also make that available um, through our safety committees and other groups so that folks can see what types of things have been reported and how we're moving forward with them. We also uh, really tightened and expanded at the same time, tightened the content, expanded the distribution of our bulletin and alerting system. We recognized that the way in which we were going about um, issuing bulletins and information to staff was more so an emphasis on quantity and not so much quality. And we discovered that we had some challenges with communicating the signal through the noise. Um, so we, we tightened criteria and created multiple levels for written communications around bulletins, alerts, um, and advisories as part of our communication. We also um, created a safety management policy document and created, I'll speak a little bit more to it later in a specific exemplar, created a safety management policy letter from Metro's senior executive team. Uh, so we drafted a letter in which every member of our senior executive team talks through our safety management policy, our core values, and the principles that guide the implementation of our SMS. It was important to us that the safety management policy not only be signed by, the, by our CEO and general manager and the safety department leadership, we felt it was really important to broaden that to the entirety of the executive team. Uh, we've also improved our communications around the agency safety plan. Uh, it is posted on our intranet, and we do have an ongoing cadence of opportunities for folks to provide feedback, request revisions, and communicate uh, any concerns or issues. We also 
recognize that all of the intranet uh, options aren't enough for employees that don't really have ready access to metro systems because they're busy operating buses and trains and performing maintenance work throughout the system. So through our structure of safety committees, we also talk through digestible portions of the agency safety plan, really highlighting specific sections of the plans and toolbox talks, make sure folks are aware of the content of the plan instead of just posting it um, and hoping that folks will take the time to sit and read through it. So we have a lot of um, work that we've done that we're very proud of um, and happy to share it, exemplars with our colleagues throughout the industry. We're working uh, pretty actively on a state of safety webinar that'll be recorded on a biannual basis. So we'll have a, uh, a review that really talks about where we are in terms of implementing our SMS, how we're performing in accordance to our goals and objectives, uh, concerns or issues that have been raised and things that are really taking our attention. We also uh, under, underwent a special project last year where we conducted a safety culture survey, uh, essentially a survey of the entirety of Metro's workforce to determine the maturity of the culture that we want to build in terms of being a proactive safety culture. Based upon the results of that survey, we've built an employee engagement plan and really are focusing on awareness of the SMS and focusing on awareness of Metro's journey to create a just culture, a culture where individuals acknowledge the fallibility of themselves and their colleagues and an environment within which we incentivize folks to report mistakes or unintended consequences or procedural escapes and recognize practical drift. And we assure our employees that we'll be dealing with those reports in a just manner that will really look at not only the individual role in the unintended consequence, but also the role of the system that Metro created, which enables those sorts of procedural escapes. For us, it's really, really important that our employees understand that we have a, a sacred covenant between the management team at Metro and our employees. And the management team is equally responsible for creating an environment that enables good decision-making uh, for all of our employees who execute safety critical tasks. Next slide. So I talked a little about the safety culture assessment. We also have some special projects around establishing standards for our safety committees. Um, Metro certainly had no dearth of safety committees, but there was a wide swath of variation in how our safety committees conducted business. And when we performed the gap assessment, setting up our agency safety plan, we recognized that we had an opportunity to standardize our safety committees, create tools and processes that enabled effective escalation of safety concerns and issues and assured not only vertical integration through an ascension process for safety concerns and issues, but also horizontal integration between our safety committees. We've also streamlined our data um, and developed enhanced dashboards to visualize that data rather than have employees look at charts um, that you know, are exceedingly numerical, we've worked on new and unique ways to visualize our safety performance so that folks could see our progress in a more of a demonstrable, very accessible manner. So we're looking at, at dials and, and meters and really following graphically driven reviews of, of safety data to inform decision-making. Moving forward, um, we're going to continue to improve our voluntary safety reporting program. We've partnered um, with a federally funded research and development center to work to identify opportunities for us to enhance not only the intake process for our voluntary safety reporting program, but the aggregation and analysis of data that we receive from our voluntary safety reporting program so that we can create 
more rapidly actionable opportunities for us to create a higher state of safety. We're also working on enhancing our recognition program. Uh, to recognize employees who are actively participating in the implementation of the safety management system and to recognize employees who've gone above and beyond and demonstrating the behaviors that we seek to in culture with folks. Lastly, uh, we've set up to conduct our safety culture assessment on an every other year basis. Uh, so the safety culture assessment that we conducted in 2022 established our baseline, identified opportunities for us to grow and mature, and also identified some strengths that we want to continue to develop. We're going to reassess uh, in 2024 just to see the progress that we've made, um, ensure that we didn't have any unintended consequences of changes that we've rolled out, and really continue to solidify our, our relentless pursuit forward in terms of improvement. Next slide, please. So uh, in terms of communication touch points, as I said earlier, we, we have a lot of multimodal efforts underway. Um, we have the traditional printed materials and some signage. We've partnered with our external communications team at Metro to really work on the aesthetics of our printed materials and signage. Uh, recognizing that printed materials and signage are great, um, but not everybody has the time nor inclination to uh, partake in reading them. We've also really emphasized the role of the human in interactions. So in our safety committees, in our toolbox talks, in meetings and webinars, we've really encouraged individual communication both um, individual to the masses, as well as individual one-on-one -on -one communications. Next slide, please. Uh, as an example, this is uh, part of our suite of safety alerts and bulletins. We've simplified them, color-coded them um, to really start differentiating the need for digestion of information and whether or not you take an action. Um, we've been working with a number of our partners throughout the authority to confirm that the messages that are being sent are readily understood. Um, and we also ensured in our templates that, again, we have that linkage to the human factor. Uh, the bottom of all of our communications are contact information for the safety hotline, for the safety department. So if individuals have questions, if something's unclear, um, they're not left to interpret the information by themselves. They can reach out and talk to a member of the safety team. Next slide, please. Uh, so as I stated, uh, on your screen on the left is the safety management policy letter, which we embedded as part of our agency safety plan. Um, in that letter, we attempted to distill the key principles that really guide our implementation of, of a safety management system at the Washington Metro. We took that letter um, and created a poster that has been displayed um, to uh, on digital screens throughout our facilities, as well as posted um, in shops and facilities throughout uh, the, the agency. Really, we wanted our, our poster effort to focus on our frontline staff and to further distill the key principles that we have um, in the implementation of, of our safety management system. One uh, critique that we had for ourselves was that as we, as we were rolling out our SMS and looking at our SMS communications, we realized as the safety subject matter experts that we weren't always using accessible language and simple analogies for folks throughout the organization to really understand. And that created gaps in terms of understanding what it meant to employees. And we really felt that, that we had an opportunity to better communicate with our staff in a manner in which they were able to be part of the change instead of alienated by acronym heavy technical language. And also I, I would like to highlight the bottom of the safety management policy poster that we've put up 
also highlights um, that the CEO and general manager, as well as our, our chief safety officer, are engaged and involved in the policy. But there are two additional signatures um, that I think are critically important, and that's the signature of our chief operating officer, as well as the signature of our chief infrastructure officer. Again, really emphasizing to folks um, that work at the front line that Metro's SMS is for everyone. Next slide, please. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, we rolled out a safety culture assessment and that safety culture assessment had a full communications plan uh, that again was, was through multimedia vehicles in terms of reaching our employees. Um, we also utilized our joint labor management safety committee to drive participation in our safety culture assessment. We had the incredible good fortune um, to really work with our labor leaders and in partnership and our um, labor organizations allowed Metro to place um, boxes to collect surveys in the union halls. Um, they served as ambassadors with their membership and communicated what the goals of our safety culture assessment were. In communicating opportunities for folks to give us information relative to the safety culture, uh, we found some key takeaways. Um, we, we saw some really great strengths in terms of immediate trust between employees and their supervisor and an overall support for safety. Um, we saw that folks take our policies and procedures very seriously. And we identified comfort in reporting concerns at that frontline level. We noted that we had some opportunities to improve around the perception of potential consequences for safety reporting and fair and uniform treatment when rules were applied. So looking at those two opportunities for improvement, we've developed our engagement strategy for 2023 and 2024 to really focus around just culture implementation, creating a learning organization where we learn from unintended outcomes and really increasing information, ensuring that our employees know what our performance looks like and understand why certain concerns and issues are being addressed in the manner that they are. Next slide, please. So uh, with that, I am happy to address uh, questions from the group. And I thank you very much for your time and the opportunity to share our efforts. Teresa, thanks so much. That was a fantastic presentation. I know um, our audience uh, has some questions they're queuing up, um, but I also want to take a moment and just ask a few questions. Um, some, some things emerged for me as you were going through that, and I, I really want to ask a few questions and, and also just thank you again for a wonderful presentation and a lot of great insight into what you're doing, how you're doing it, and also really importantly, the why. Um, I heard a lot of that in there, and I think that's really important for you know, in, in thinking about how to communicate this out to the organization. Emphasizing the why for people is a really important one. So a couple of questions jump out at me. Um, one is um, when you, let's take the podcast, for example. Um, it's a great, great example of a way to get information out in a way that's incredibly ex uh, accessible to people. It doesn't, there's, doesn't require a lot of, or it doesn't create a lot of hurdles or obstacles to getting to information. It sounds to me like it's particularly effective in reaching frontline workers, frontline employees who are not going to, for instance, log into an internet and get their information, but getting a podcast out to them. Can you just talk a little bit more about how you make sure that employees are aware of the, the podcast and how they can get it and the timing of them? Are these five minute episodes, 10 minute, you know, what's your sort of length and so forth? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for the question. So in formulating the podcast, we, we did break them up and scale them to the topic at hand. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have short um, digestible podcasts, five minutes. Um, and then we have some longer podcasts that are Q and A sessions, um, with some of Metro's leadership team. One of the things that we found that was really effective about the podcasts were that they're able to be listened to in a start stop fashion and fully offline. Um, so again, in encouraging that, that partnership, 
with our, our labor organizations and our safety committees, we were able to link our podcasts to social media channels that our labor organizations use to communicate with their workforce. We did a couple podcasts with members of the Joint Labor Management Safety Committee talking about what that committee does. And we were incredibly fortunate that the union sat around the table with Metro's leaders that were on that committee talking through why that committee um, was formed and what we address and how to raise concerns and issues. Of course, we still have links, we still have emails, we have blast communications. Um, we have a one-stop shop set up on our intranet. So if anybody wants to see kind of the full library of our podcast, they can go on and see that. Um, but we also push that in weekly messages and blitzes to our employees. Excellent, that's, that's really great to hear. And then a question on your visuals. So the, the example you showed of the safety management policy, um, a couple of things really stood out for me. One is the language on that. You know, it's clearly, you spend some time thinking about how do you distill that message? So they're, they're exactly the four key principles um, and, and kind of the language around it. Um, you've done an excellent job, I think, at framing this in a way that it doesn't feel like a page out of a plan kind of document, which obviously you need to have that in your ASP, full, you know, full disclosure, we've got to meet our requirements. But this document on, that you have on the right there, the poster, is the kind of thing that's going to catch people's eyes when they're in the bus garage or in the rail yard or, you know, in, in maintenance facility and so forth. Um, talk to us about your process on that, too. Um, and the reason I ask that question is because I want to make sure that for Folks on the call who might be at smaller agencies, maybe looking at this going, that looks great, but oh my gosh, do I have the resources to make something like that? Um, tell, tell us how we can do this in a way that, you know, is going to make people feel like, okay, I could pull up Word and do something like that too. Yeah, absolutely. So while we are incredibly fortunate to be a larger agency that has significant resources at our disposal, uh, sophistication doesn't always equal effectiveness. And one of the things that we started seeing as we were communicating about our, our safety management system was that we could create you know, all the glossy, beautiful pamphlets that we wanted, but if the content wasn't digestible and targeted, it really wouldn't resonate or resonate with our frontline workforce. So um, we made deliberate decisions, uh, for example, in the policy letter poster to use visuals from our frontline workforce so that folks could see themselves in the poster. And we, we worked hard with focus groups and safety committees to try and make sure that they understood those four key principles. Um, one of the things that we've communicated to our staff um, at all levels of the organization is an easy way to gauge the effectiveness of your SMS is your employee's ability to execute number one um, on the key principles. If you were to walk to any employee and ask that employee, what are your top safety risks? If that employee can answer what their top safety risks are, you have succeeded in creating an environment where folks are informed and knowledgeable about their risk. Second question, what's being done about those safety risks? If you approach an employee and they're able to answer that, you've now got an engaged, knowledgeable employee who understands how the risk management process is being applied to the risk they face every day. And then lastly, um, how well are those, are those efforts to control that risk working? If you can have the vast majority of your employees able to answer those three questions, you have succeeded in terms of awareness, safety communication, and overall engagement with the risk management process. We found that to be the most powerful um, out of all the principles that we worked with our staff on. Excellent. That's 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 great to hear. And then the last thing I want to ask, and then we're going to jump into our um, our audience Q and A. And I just want to remind for our audience: um, if you've got a question and you haven't yet put it in the chat pod, now's the time. We're going to uh, start to answer those momentarily. And then, Teresa, my last question for you is around, uh, you mentioned the, um, the safety culture assessment, and you mentioned the increasing focus on just culture. I'd love to hear just a little bit about how your frontline workers in particular are responding to that, uh, that sort of bringing that into, the, in, into integrating with SMS. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So we, we've taken a, a lot of time to evaluate 
barriers to enhancing our safety culture. And one thing that our survey showed us, as well as our, our prior experience anecdotally showed us, is if folks are willing to bring you a safety concern or issue that involves an unintended outcome, and your response to their disclosure of that unintended outcome is heavy handed, you have now suppressed any desire to report those concerns or issues because you've immediately operant conditioned your workforce to expect some type of a negative uh, behavioral reinforcement. Mm -hmm. So for us, we realized it, it was really important and it was going to be a journey and an effort where we weren't always going to get it right but it was really important for us to create an environment where our employees felt comfortable putting their hands up and saying, this didn't work out the way it was supposed to work out. And I think I may have been a part of that. I made a mistake. I was confused. I didn't understand. And in incentivizing employees to come forward with that, we really found that we do two things. One, we, we undercut the likelihood for folks to hide things. Um, and two, by letting us know what happened when the consequence may be very minor, we are afforded an opportunity to dig in more deeply into causal factors and correct it before it happens the next time. What we saw um, as we started communicating that to our workforce was a little bit of disbelief or skepticism on behalf of our workers. You know, our culture as an industry is very rules and process driven. And we don't have a tolerance for folks circumventing those rules, nor should we. Um, what, what we saw with our employees at, at first was a pretty healthy dose of uh, wait and see attitude. And once we had the first couple of folks who, who were brave and who spoke up and said, hey, we had an unintended outcome here, the way in which we were able to work with them to identify what drove the unintended outcome really gave us a superior opportunity to address the process. Humans will make choices, but they'll make choices within the environment that enables their decision-making. And it let us see that some of our processes weren't clear. Some of our systems enabled decision-making that led towards essentially unforced errors um, and working with employees who brought those concerns and issues with us to close those gaps and eliminate the opportunities for procedural escape really made true believers out of folks. You know, when they saw accountability ascend the management chain from the person who made the mistake to the person who created the system within which the mistake was made, they started realizing um, that their role is invaluable and that we really meant what we said. Um, as I said, it's a journey. We, we certainly won't get it perfectly. And, and we've emphasized to our staff that the same grace that we're giving them in our just culture um, is expected in return. That you know, we do want to learn from areas where maybe we could have addressed things a little bit better, but we want to make sure that we coach employees who make good decisions in bad circumstances. And we wanna console employees who have unintended outcomes through no fault of their own. And then, you know, should employees make decisions that are knowingly bad decisions that circumvent our rules, we won't tolerate that and we'll apply the appropriate sanction. And we found it's a process. Um, it won't turn our culture overnight, but it's been invaluable to us to really get insight into what drives our safety beyond the engineered systems that we have. I think you make such an excellent point there that to your point about, you know, not tolerating uh, intentionally circumventing a rule, but understanding the clear distinction between an instance where that happens versus an instance where a rule is not clear, an environment, you know, there's potential for confusion, there's potential for a genuine misunderstanding, and as you say, for that to lead to an unforced error and to treat those as what they really are, which is, you know, teachable moments slash learnable opportunities to say, okay, how, you know, if we punish this, if we penalize this, we're not going to ultimately improve the root cause, whereas if we, if we 
if we take a different approach, we're going to have an opportunity to really address the root cause of it. I think that's so important. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I certainly, and to your point about accountability, seeing accountability as something that is not just something that flows down, but that accountability goes up to the top of the leadership chain. It's both in line with SMS. And it's something that certainly I think back to my time on the agency side of our industry. And it's it's a goal we should all be striving for, is for people to feel like accountability is at all levels. It goes it goes in both directions. And, and for people to see that at all levels, I think really strengthens their belief that the system works uh, and works well. So let's jump into, and we've got just a few minutes left, but I want to highlight a couple of Q&A questions. So one from our audience is, um, could you just briefly tell us some of the topics that you cover in your SMS training workshop, Lunch and Learns? Yeah, so uh, certainly. So uh, we cover essentially two different two different topical areas. Um, in-house to the safety team, we'll cover deep dives into certain aspects of safety management. Um, we'll cover things like fall protection and have a, a primer for staff on fall protection, you know, where it came from, the rules, the regulations, how to be a competent person, et cetera, to really raise the skill level amongst the group. Also, we've started with our lunch and learns to concentrate external to the safety department with other departments at Metro. Um, we've had series where we've had individuals from our signal system engineering team come in or our bus maintenance team come in and explain to safety department employees the design principles of a signaling system. Not so that they can you know, draw or interpret um, signal, signal circuits, but so that they understand the basis associated with this safety critical system that keeps them safe. Um, so really we look internal to safety for subject matter depth and expertise, as well as external to safety to raise folks general level of knowledge of the transit industry. That's excellent. And then our last question, just to wrap up, uh, we had another commenter who asked us if you could elaborate a bit on your close call reporting system. So the, the system that's different from your employee safety reporting program, if you could just tell us a little bit more about uh, your approach to that as well. Yeah, uh, certainly. So uh, Metro has essentially multiple avenues for employees to report safety concerns and issues, and we're channeling those reports to the system of reporting that best addresses those reports. So Metro's safety hotline is meant for employees who see conditional issues or who have very urgent safety concerns. Um, they can call that hotline, speak immediately to a person, identify an issue that requires mitigation, and the safety team will jump into action. Our confidential close call reporting program really focuses on issues around procedural escapes really focuses on scenarios where, but for an employee's self-identification and disclosure of an unintended consequence, Metro largely wouldn't have known. Mm -hmm. So that, that program involves a third-party data broker. So our employees can make that report fully independent of the Metro system and the Metro management chain. Those types of reports are usually concerns or issues with procedural deficiencies where procedures aren't clear or there are conflicting steps or near miss type incidents that result from gaps in training or gaps in oversight. Those um, are de-identified by our third party provider and then reviewed by peer review teams at Metro who look at what led to these types of unintended consequences and make recommendations to management. So immediate pressing safety issues go through the safety hotline and we can offer um, confidentiality of employees when they talk to safety if they don't want to disclose their identity. And um, issues that are more procedural, more systemic type issues, those are channeled to the close call reporting program for appropriate de-identification and then review by the peer review teams and recommendations to management. Excellent. Teresa, I want to thank you again for an excellent presentation, a lot of great insights, and a great conversation. Um, thanks for answering all these questions. And um, we, to our audience out there, we look forward to having you back uh, for our next webinar in September. And in the meantime, uh, as you sign out of the webinar today, you'll get a survey. Uh, we encourage you to submit your responses to that survey to continue to provide us feedback so we can continue to offer webinars that 
uh, meet your needs. And with that, I thank everybody and we'll see you next time.